Hello, my name is John Lee and I'm the president of Alpha Training and Consulting and I love to prepare students for ASQ certification exams. I love it. However, today what we're going to do is we're going to go over practice exam questions for the Six Sigma Green Belt exam. And we're getting those questions from the Certified Six Sigma Green Belt Primer that's published and distributed from Quality Council of Indiana. We'll talk about a great company, a great group of people. I've been working with them for decades. They gave us permission to use these questions, and I greatly appreciate them. Thank you, in Quality Council of Indiana. And we use their primer in our online class. We have you listen to all our lectures, take our exams, then at the end we have you review the primer and uh, take the end of chapter questions. And we go over all the solution to all those questions in our online class. If you're interested in that online class, just go to www.asqcssgb.com. Again, that's ASQCSSGB, which stands for what? Certified Six Sigma Greenbelt. So ASQ Certified Six Sigma Greenbelt.com, and that whole website is dedicated to the Greenbelt exam. There's about over 10 embedded videos in there, answers any question you would possibly have concerning the Greenbelt certification. All right, let's get started on those questions. Question six, and I'll read that again. Increasing performance in a Lean Six Sigma corporation, meaning one and a half sigma shift, from three sigma to four sigma would reduce defects per million by a factor of what? All right, and the table you'll need in order to solve this problem is in the appendix, and in my revision, it's page three, and it's six sigma failure rates, and uh, with a one and a half sigma process shift, or with no process. Now you can do it on the Z table, uh, but let me read the question again here. Increasing performances in a Lean Six Sigma Corporation. As soon as it says Lean Six Sigma Corporation, you know they're going to take into account the one and a half sigma shift. And that's why you'll use uh, this table right here. You'll be using the one with the shift, not with no shift. Now remember, you could also do this by uh, going to your Z table and what, what they're at three sigma and four sigma and take three sigma subtract one and a half from it and then uh, which would give us one and a half sigmas that you'd look up in the Z table and four sigma and look up uh, two and a half a Z of two and a half would give you the same answer as this table here but this table makes it a little quicker and of course we like to go fast so let's look at three sigma here and it tells us Three sigma with the one and a half sigma shift is 66,810.63 parts per million. So I'm going to write that down. 66,810.63 parts per million. Okay, that's for three sigma. Now we'll go to four sigma column here, and there it is, 6,209.7, 6,209.7 parts per million. And so now let's go to the whiteboard and calculate this out and get the correct answer. All right, so here we are at the whiteboard. To get the factor, we take the 66,810.63 parts per million, and uh, remember that was for three sigma, divided by 6,209.7 parts per million. Remember, this was for the four sigma process. So let's divide that out and see what our factor of improvement is. Here we go, 66,810.63 divided by 6,209.7 equals and so we're a factor of 10.76. Now ASQ just kind of rounds things off a lot of times, so this may just, the correct answer may be 10. But let's go back to our question sheet and uh, see if uh, we can find the correct answer. All right, here we are back at question six, and I'll read that again. Increasing performance in a Lean Six Sigma Corporation, meaning one and a half sigma shift, from three sigma to four sigma would reduce defects per million by a factor of what? There it is. It was 10.7 something. If there was an 11, I'd pick it, but there's not. 10 is the closest thing to it. So I'm going to go with C. And uh, that's uh, question 6 uh, is C, so that is correct. All right, here we are at question 13. 
What is the best upper management reason for not providing black belt assistant to an improvement team? What is the best upper management reason for not providing black belt assistance? I mean, the thing that comes to my mind is maybe it's not that difficult of a project. Black belt resources might may be tight. I do like the may be there, but that's about the only thing this has going for it. Remember, may is a non-absolute, and it's usually uh, correct. However, it is not the most powerful test-taking skill. <clears throat> so if this is a hair splitter question, I'm going to go with A. But I don't like this answer, but I'm going to see if there's a better one. It forces the team to develop their own skills. Yes. It may not be required. This is also a non-absolute. And so I like this one. I like C better than I like A. It requires the team to ask for help. No, why, what, you know, so is this some kind of ego trip or what? That's ridiculous. So it may not be required. It's either A or C. It may not be required or black belt resources may be tight. Both non-absolutes. So that's not going to help me uh, with this tie. I like this one. It may just not be required. It was my first thought when I read through this. So I'm going to go with C. 213 is C, and yes it is. Here we are at question 7. A Six Sigma project requires $23,000 of initial investment and the training costs of 6000 So notice we have 30000 invested thus far. Spread over a six-month period. Okay, so it's going to take six months to finish this project, sounds like. The project is expected to save the company $3,000 per month, starting in the third month. So we have three months where we can't start collecting savings. Okay, so already it's taken three months. Starting in the third month, ignoring interest and taxes, what is the payback period? Okay, in other words, how long is it going to take me to get my $29,000 back if I'm paying $3,000 a month? So let's go to the whiteboard and work this one out. All right, here we are at the whiteboard. I wrote down the cost that we're going to invest. We're going to invest $23,000 up front, $6,000 for training. So we add those together and get $29,000. Then we take $29,000, and how long is it going to take us if we're, charging, if we're getting back $3,000 per month? So we pull out our trusty calculator here and go $29,000 dollars divided by three thousand dollars three thousand equals nine point six six seven months okay and it took how long before we could implement this because payback starts the minute you start investing money so day one and we had to go three months so you have to add three months to nine months and uh, they're going to probably round it to whole numbers. They did, if I remember correctly. So this is either going to be 9 plus 3, which will be 12, or 9 plus, or 10, if you round it to 10, and uh, plus the 3 months. So it's either going to be 12 or 13 months. Let's go back to the question and see if that answer exists. All right, here we are, and uh, let's read that again. A Six Sigma project requires $23,000 of initial investment and training costs of 6000 spread over a six-month period. And then it says the project is expected to save 3000 per month starting in the third month. So we calculated nine or ten months. So a lot of people are going to pick nine or ten months depending on how you round it. But it's incorrect. Why? Because the payback period starts the moment you start investing money into this. And they start investing money three months before. So it's either going to be... Uh, 12 or 13, when you add the three months in, uh, depending on which way you're around, 13 months is not an option, but 12 months is, so 3.7 is D. Let me check that out real quick, and yes, it is. All right, here we are at question 14. The term metrics most frequently refers to what? Okay, a unit of measurement? Could be, it is a measurement, so I'm not going to throw A out. B, the metric system, no. Net present value, uh, maybe if you meet your metrics, you'll have a good net present value, but it doesn't align to that statement. 
So B and C are out of there. The best one so far is A. An evaluation method, yes. You give people metrics and see if they can reach those metrics. If they do, they're doing a good job. If they exceed them, they're doing a great job. If they don't meet them, they're not doing such a good job. So it is an evaluation method. So it's either A or D, but I feel D uh, best aligns with the intent of this question. So 314 is D. And that is true. Many training instructors have developed approaches to emphasize multiple sense learning. Which of the following options would be generally recognized to best foster student retention? Reading and hearing, yes, that's better than just reading. Uh, hearing and seeing, that's also good. Seeing and speaking, reading and seeing. So there's one thing that sets this apart as the correct answer, and that's speaking. And it all comes from the philosophy of if you really want to learn something, teach it. Okay, if you want to really get to know something better, you teach those principles. So speaking is going to be the big one that pushes it over the edge for C. So it's going to be seeing and speaking. I'm quite certain, but I'm still going to check. Uh, four two is C. Yes, it is. Okay, team briefing presentations to senior management should include which of the following considerations? Okay, what do we know about senior management? They don't have a lot of time. So when we do work with senior management, we're supposed to do it very efficiently. We talked about that in the test taking uh, skills modules. So again, team briefing presentations to senior management should include which of the following considerations? Since time of senior management is value, address all potential details. No. And the first part's okay, since the time of senior management is valuable, but it should say, you know, just address the main points. It says all details. That's not good. So A is out of there. B, every member of the team should have a speaking briefing role. Uh, yeah, if that works, but I'm not going to do it just so everyone can get a pat on the back. I'm in front of senior management. The most important thing is that I communicate efficiently, effectively, and get out of there because they don't have a lot of time. Okay. Okay. Identify the problem of the proposed action desired. Identify the problem and the proposed. I like that one. I really like that one. You're just getting right down to the point and getting out of there. Handouts should require author's explanations. Uh, not really. I think uh, senior management, just come in, tell me what I need to know, and leave because I have a lot of other things to do. And so I think it's C on this one. 4.5 is C. Okay, it is. Question one. A customer satisfaction program was started on the right foot, and it has gone very well for the last year or so. The company should now do what? Well, this is a typical ASQ value system type question. What does ASQ want you to do? Continue to improve. Continue, proce continual process improvement. That's what they're all about. It's the end game. That and creating a profit. Okay, so what are they going to want you to do? Look to improve the program? Yes, that's going to be correct, at least that part. With new what? Customer input. Both of those are very powerful value system qualifiers there. So no doubt, A is the correct one. It hit with both improve and customer input. You can't get better than that. If I'm taking the test, I'm picking A, I'm not even going to read the rest because you can't get a better answer to that, uh, to response to that statement than A. Do nothing with the program, it's not broken. No, that is not an ASQ philosophy or value system. Form a management group to add new wrinkles. No, they don't like that type of thing. They like it to be real, real effective. Stop collecting data to save money. No, no doubt this one is A. Which of the following is a primary reason for periodic project reviews. Okay, uh, so it's important when you do a project to do project reviews. Usually follows the project uh, life cycle or work breakdown structure, but usually the project life cycle. After every step in the project life cycle, then you meet and you make sure you met all the requirements of that particular project life cycle. And if, once you meet it, everyone signs off on it. And that gives you permission to move forward. And so that's what we're talking about here. So which of following is a primary reason for periodic project reviews? To highlight the project team's efforts? No. Remember, ASQ loves effectiveness. And uh, this isn't about effectiveness, it's about patting each other on the back. And it's, I'm not saying that's not important, 
but uh, the primary reason is going to be more to make things effective. To update goal achievement, yeah, it's about goal achievement. I like that, but is it just to update? I don't know about that one. A is gone. B, I'm going to hang on to for right now. To expand the schedule, no, C is out of there. To increase the cost, of course not. So I like uh, goal achievement is good. Updates kind of strange to me, but of all the options, B is definitely the best one. So 510, is it B? Yes, it is. All right, 6.1, one would normally describe recorded values reflecting length, volume, and time as measurable. Yes, they're all measurable. Discrete? No, they're not discrete. Remember, discrete is attribute to options, and uh, so that doesn't fit any of those elements there. Uh, discrete, anything with discrete is wrong. So A and B are wrong, and C are wrong. So you only have one option, uh, continuous, measurable, and variable. Yes, all three of those are continuous, measurable, and variable. So 6.1 should be C, and it is. When performing calculations on sample data, a continuous relative frequency graph called a histogram results. I don't know. It be, depends on what kind of sample data. So no, I don't think A is correct. Uh, besides, when I do perform calculations, Calculations doesn't necessarily mean graphical. I guess it could, but there's just too many holes in A. A is out of there. Rounding the data has no effect on the mean and standard deviation. Yeah, you can round things incorrectly, for one thing. Um, so that could be a problem. I would throw out A, though. I'd keep B before I'd throw out A. Or I mean I'd keep B, so I would throw out A. Let's look at C. Coding the data has no effect on the mean and standard deviation. No, it has an effect. I think I'm going to go to the whiteboard and go over this one a little more. Uh, because I don't think it's A or B. I really don't. And so I think it's going to be C or D. Coding and rounding affect both the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, well, let's go to the whiteboard and discuss question two. All right, here we are at the whiteboard. Uh, notice I have three numbers here, 301, 302, 303. And when I have a test question, this is usually what I do. Uh, when it's concerning coded data. And I already know from past experience, 1, 2, and 3 gives me a standard deviation of 1. We performed that in some of the modules. We'll do it again here. But uh, here's my data. I code it to just be 1, 2, and 3. And my average becomes 2, and my standard deviation is 1. So, it, so now let's do the non-coded data. My average is 302. So if I plug 1, 2, and 3, I get an average of 2. If I plug in 301, 302, 303, the non-coded data, I get 302. So did it change the average? Absolutely. Okay, then I take the standard deviation of the non-coded, I get 1. I take the standard deviation of the coded, I get 1. So in this case, standard deviation didn't change, uh, but the average did. So let's go back and look at the question again, see if we can find the right answer. All right, here we are back at question two. We know it's either C or D. Coded data has no effect on the mean and the standard deviation. Well, in our example, it did change the mean, so I'd throw out C. Coded, uh, coding and rounding. Oh, I didn't see this first. Coding and rounding affect both the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, uh, we already discussed rounding can most certainly have an impact. And so... Uh, on this, even on the standard deviation. Coding, we know, has a difference on the mean, but didn't have an impact on the standard deviation. But rounding will impact both of them. So that's going to be the correct answer must be D. 6.2 is D. Yes, it is. Let's go on to 7.7. .7. The reported CPK for a process with an average of 28 and a spread of 10 units. Okay, what does spread mean? Okay, here's another one. Spread means, is another words way of saying, we plus minus three sigma, okay? So you have to remember the spread. We also had another term here a minute ago, the natural limits or something like that. It means the same as spread. Uh, but you're more likely to hear the word spread on the certification exam. It means plus minus three sigmas. And upper and lower specification limits of 35 and 15 respectively would be. So they're looking for the CPK. Well, you can calculate CP upper and CP lower, but this is a time test. 
So you don't want to calculate both if you don't have to. How do you know which one's going to be the CP? CP upper, CP lower is going to be the CPK. Well, it's which, wherever the average is closer to. Then here's the upper spec limit. How far away are they from 28 to 35? 35 minus 28 is 7. Okay, so we're 7 units away from the upper spec limit, the averages. 28 uh, and 15, 28 minus 15 is uh, 15, 25, it's going to be 13. So there's 13 units from 20 to the average to the lower spec limit. There's uh, only 7 to the upper spec limit. So CP upper is going to be CPK. Now, some of you will get that, some of you will not, it's okay. We're going to go to the whiteboard and draw some pictures and work this out. All right, here we are at the whiteboard, and I've drawn out the lower spec limit and the upper spec limit that was given in the problem. Then I just found the middle, right in between there was 25. Now, the average of the distribution is 28. And I wrote 25 in here so I can get an idea of which side uh, 28 lies on. And of course, what you have to ask yourself, is 28 between 25 and 15, or is 28 between 25 and 35? Of course, it's between 25 and 35. So I'm going to draw it out here. This will be the average of my distribution, which is 28. And then uh, I always draw the distribution, just so I don't forget what I'm doing. And which one is the average closer to? The upper spec limit or the lower spec limit? It's closer to the upper spec limit. So if you wanted to, we could get this answer. Remember, CPK is the lower of CP upper and CP lower. I already know the lower, the CPK is going to be CP upper. But you may not know that, so we'll do both just in case. And so here is the formula, CP upper equals upper spec limit minus the average divided by three standard deviations. Now, the question said the spread of the distribution is, what was it, 10 units. Okay, what does the spread mean? It means plus minus 3. So the width of this whole distribution here, plus minus 3 is 10. Well, 3 sigma is half of that. So this is going to not be 10, 3 sigma is 5, because plus minus 3 sigma is 10. So just 3 sigma will be half of that will make uh, 3 sigma equal to 5. What am I worried about here more than anything else? You have to understand that the spread means plus minus 3 sigma. And the calculation for uh, CP upper and CP lower is 3 sigmas. So it's only half of the 10 is, is going to give us 5. So hopefully you're okay with that. Now let's put in the upper spec limit is uh, 35. minus the average, which is 28. And that is going to equal, let's get out our calculator. There we go. 35 minus 28 equals, divided by 5, equals 1.4. So the CP upper is going to be 1.4. And there we have it. Now, I already know that CPK because this is a shorter distance than over here. But let's say you don't feel comfortable with that, so you just want to do the calculations. That's okay. It doesn't take that long. CP lower equals average minus the lower spec limit divided by 3 sigma. Now, we remember, we know 3 sigma is equal to 5 because the spread was 10. Half of that's 5. And then the average is 28, let's put that in there, 28 minus 15, and let's get our calculator out and we'll calculate CP lower, 28 minus 15 equals, divided by 5, equals 2.6, so CP lower equals 2.6.
Now remember what CPK is, that's what they ask us to calculate. CPK is the lesser of CP upper and CP lower. So the lesser is 1.4. So that will be the correct answer to this question. Let's go back to the blue page and make sure that answer is available. All right, here we are back at the blue page and notice uh, we do have the answer B, 1.4. So that is the correct answer for question seven. Now let's go on to question 10. A process consists of three uh, sequential steps. Which of the following with, with the following yields? Step one, 99.8. Step two, 97.4. Uh, step three, 96.4. Determine the do total defects per unit. So if it was rolled throughput yield, you would just uh, multiply all those together. But if it's defects per unit, that's something different. It's the natural log, defects per unit is the natural log of rolled throughput yield. It's the negative natural log of the rolled throughput yield. So first we have to calculate the throughput yield or rolled throughput yield, and that's multiplying all of those together. Let's go to the whiteboard and work this out. All right, here we are back at the whiteboard, and notice those were our numbers. Let me check and make sure I wrote them down correctly. 0.998, yes. 0.974 and 0.964. Yes, that's correct. And the uh, first thing we have to do is calculate the road throughput yield for, because, uh, what did they ask for? Total defects per unit. There's a formula. We didn't cover this in our lectures. This comes from the primer. So you may want to go back and study some of the formulas for defects per unit. Uh, but I looked that up and put it down here for us. But uh, total defects per unit equals the negative of the natural log of the rolled throughput yield. So first we have to calculate rolled throughput yield. What is rolled throughput yield? Where you multiply all those together. Remember the AND statements? To get a good part, this has to be good, AND this has to be good, AND this has to be good. AND statements with independence means you multiply them all together. I can guarantee you, you'll have to know rolled throughput yield on the test. I don't know about defects per unit. Sometimes it shows up. Sometimes it does not. But road throughput yield always shows up. And so let's go ahead and calculate the road throughput yield. Be sure and clear your calculator before starting the calculation. 0.998 times 0.974 times 0.964. And assuming I didn't hit any buttons wrong, the road put throughput yield is 0 0.9371. 0 0.9371. Now, we need to put road throughput yield into the total defects per unit formula. And so we go 0 0.9371. I'll put that right here. I'm running out of space, but that's 0.9371. It's hard to read, isn't it? And uh, now I'm going to go, since I already have the numbers in there without any rounding, I'm just going to use that. Now I'm going to hit the natural log, which is right up here at the top row, uh, top, yeah, row, third col fourth column over. One, two, three, four, natural log. And I'm going to hit that. Notice it has a negative, but this formula has a negative, so it's you have to take the negative of that. And you do that by just hitting this button right here, the plus minus button. So this is the answer. The road throughput or the total defects per unit is 0 0.065. So let's go back to the blue page and make sure that's an option. So here we are back at the blue pages, and 0.065 is an option, and it's B, and B is the correct answer for question 10. All right, here we are at question 3. A random sample size N is to be taken from a large population having a standard deviation of 1. The sample size is to be determined so that there will be a 5% risk probability of exceeding 0.01, in other words, 5% alpha risk, a 0.1 tolerance error in using the sample mean to estimate mu. Which of the following values is nearest the required sample size? Okay, this is a very common test question, and it has to do with that formula for sample sizes. So we're going to go to the whiteboard and work this one out. 
All right, here we are at the whiteboard. Here's the formula you need to know. If this is not in your formula package, please write it in there. And it says n, or sample size, equals z squared times sigma squared divided by what I call delta squared. I think in the primer they call it e or error. Um, but this is the practical significance, and that is point 0.1. And uh, let me read that again, because uh, a random sample size of n is to be taken from a large population having a standard deviation of 1. Put it right there. The sample size is to be determined so that there will be a 5% alpha risk probability of exceeding the 0.1 tolerance error. Okay. So basically they're saying this is the practical significance. And the 0.1 here, it doesn't say it's greater than or less than. It just says it wants to know if it's a difference at 0.1, which means plus minus. That means it's two-tailed. So when you look up the 5% alpha risk for Z, you have to look up the 2.5%. Don't forget that. It's probably one of the big reasons people miss this question. And on every ASQ exam I've ever taken, and I've taken a lot of them, it's always, with this formula, they always use the two-tail. So 1.96. All right. And now, once you understand that, it's just a matter of putting it in the formula, which I've uh, done here and uh, plugging away in your calculator. So let's do that. And it's going to be 1.96 squared times 1 squared. We, are, we didn't really need to do that, did we? Equals. Then divided by 0.1 squared. Don't forget to square everything. That'll get you in trouble quickly. And that gives me a sample size of 384.16. Now, on these types of calculations, they'll usually round down 384. Uh, but let's go to the blue pages and see what the options are. All right, here we are back at the blue pages. And notice for the last question, the closest one there is A385. That is the correct answer. All right, 819. In an experiment designed to compare two different ways of measuring a given quantity... In an experiment designed to compare two different ways of measuring a given quantity, it was desired to test the null hypothesis that the means were equal at the 5% alpha risk level of significance. A sample of five parts was measured by method A, and a sample of seven parts with method B. A T ratio of 2.179 was obtained. So they already calculated it for you. All that you have to do is go in and look at the T-critical, compare them, and make a decision. So let's look at the, the numbers again. A sample of five parts was measured by method A and seven by method B. So what we're going to do is we're going to add the two together and subtract two. That's the formula for degrees of freedom for T. So five parts plus seven parts is 12 minus two is 10. So let's go to the T-table and look up degrees of freedom for 10. But uh, is this a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test? That the means were equal. It's a two-tailed test, so we're going to have to look up 2.5% alpha risk with 10 degrees of freedom. So here we are at the T-table. Remember, there were 10 degrees of freedom for a 2.5% alpha risk, 2.5% right there. Uh, 2.28 is the critical statistic. And I can't remember right now uh, what the other, what the calculator was. It seems like it was 1.7. And that being the case, it would be statistically insignificant because the calculated is greater than, or the critical is greater than the calculated. But let's go back and check on that. Remember, 2.5% uh, alpha risk, 10 degrees of freedom is 2.228. Now, another thing I wanted to bring up, when you're using these tables, notice I... Uh, darken these two cells in because this is the 5%, 2.5%. They're the most common. What some students sometimes do is they go over here for their 2.5%. That's not 2.5% alpha risk, that's 25%. So be cautious of that, please. Let's go back and remember 2.28 and answer this question. Okay, and the T ratio was 2.179, and we looked up at 2.28. 
So the calculated is less than the critical, so we do not have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Reject the hy null hypothesis? No. Fail to reject the null hypothesis? Yes. It's going to be B. Conclude that A is greater than B. Uh, conclude, I, let's look and see if it's B. 819 is B, and it is. B is the correct answer for question 19. A two-level, five-factor experiment is being conducted to optimize the reliability of an electronic control module. Okay. A half-replicate of the full uh, factorial experiment is proposed. The number of treatments, or runs, combinations, will be what? Well, first we have to do the full factorial, how many runs, then we have to divide that by two. So remember how that works. This will be, the base number will be 2 to the 5th power. So let's do that. 2 to the 5th power. So 2, yx, 5 equals, and that's 32 runs for a full factorial. Now they want to run half, so I'm going to divide that by 2. And it ends up being 16. So 16 will be the right uh, answer, assuming they don't have replicates. And they didn't state replicates in here uh, as far as replicating the runs. So the correct answer will be uh, 16B. All right, here we are in question 50, the last one for this lecture. And it's consider the following, and they give us a DOE. And uh, let's see how many runs there are here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's a two by three, because there's uh, three factors, one response variable. Notice how it goes minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, half, minus, half, plus. This is a full factorial design. And it says, what is the main effect of temperature in this experiment? So they're wanting us to find the effect of this one. And we've done this. You know, should know how to do this by now. You take the average when it's negative, so you take 60, 54, 52, and 45, and you would take the average. Then you take the average when it was positive, 72, 68, 83, and 60. You'd, so you take the average when it's positive, average when it's negative, you subtract the average of the negative from the average of the positive, and that is called the effect. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, you should know how to do that by now. And, uh, but I will tell you what the correct answer is for 50. When you do that, it should be A. But please take the time to do that. 10.7. A process is in control with a p-bar of 0 0.10 and a sample size of 100. I'm assuming sample size is constant. The three sigma limits of the NP control chart are, okay, you're going to get these types of questions, so you'll need to go and look up the control limit formulas, and I want you to do that, maybe put this on pause, make sure you can find those, because if you can't, you're going to be in trouble in the test. In the meantime, I'm going to go over to the whiteboard and write those formulas out and get ready to solve this problem, but make sure you know where to find these. Let's go to the whiteboard. All right, here we are at the whiteboard. Notice I wrote the formula out. This is going to be a time test, so I'm not going to calculate the upper control limit and the lower control limit if I don't have to. That could, you know, approximate double the time. So I'm just going to do one, see if I can get the correct answer. I always use the uh, upper control limit because I get to add and subtract. It just makes it a little easier on my calculator uh, moves. Okay, so this is the formula, np bar plus 3 times the square root of np bar times 1 minus p bar. Uh, make sure you can find that in your formula sheet. If, you, if it's not there, write it in there. Remember, we want all the formulas in one place, so you don't have to look throughout the, the primer. And p bar was a given of uh, 0.10 or 10%. In sample size equals 100. It is constant because they ask us to calculate the NP chart. And NP chart demands constant sample size. P chart does not, if you'll recall. Okay, what is, now we have to calculate NP bar. Well, NP bar is a formula. N times P bar. Okay, so N is 100. P 
p-bar is 0 0.10. I multiply both of those to get in p-bar. That's 10. That, what does that mean? It means on average I get 10 bad parts per subgroup. All right. Now let's put those numbers into our formula. So np-bar, like I said, is 10. So there's my 10 for np-bar plus 3 times the square root of np-bar. There's my 10 again times 1 minus p bar, which is 1 minus 0 0.10. And now let's just pull our calculator out and uh, start crunching numbers. So 1 minus uh, 0 0.10, of course, is 0 0.9 times 10 equals 9 square root equals 3 so this whole square root thing is equal to 3 times 3 equals 9 plus 10 equals 19. Of course, you'll probably be able to do a lot of that in your head and do it much quicker than we just did. And that's good. Uh, but let's go back to the blue pages and see if this is one of the options. So here we are back at the blue pages and notice uh, there is a 19. I believe that's what we calculated it is. And uh, that is the correct answer. All right, here we are at question 12. An X bar and R chart was prepared for an operation using 20 samples with five pieces in each sample. That's good. Remember, they'll test you on that sometime. You need to have at least 20 subgroups before you uh, calculate the upper and lower control limit. It should be over a reasonable amount of time to where the average has time to fluctuate and everything. And so all is good thus far. X bar was found to be 33.6 and R bar was uh, 6.20. When they start throwing out numbers, it means you're going to have to do some calculations. I was surprised that there's not numbers down here for answers. But let's read on. During production, a sample of five was taken and the pieces measured, these numbers. At the time this sample was taken, both the average and range were within control limits neither the average nor range were within control limits, etc., etc. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to ca have to calculate the upper and lower control limit on both the average and range chart, calculate this sample and range from this sample, sample average and sample range, and see how it relates to those control limits. Well, this is going to demand that we go to the whiteboard. Let's go to the whiteboard and work this out. All right, here we are at the whiteboard. Notice I wrote everything out. We're going to use an X bar R chart. That was a given in the problem. They gave us X double bar of 33.6. They gave us R bar of 6.20. We need to calculate the upper and lower control limit. And the upper control limit is X double bar plus A2 times R bar. I wrote these down, but make sure you can find those formulas and you can find them quickly and you feel good about it confidently. Okay, and lower control limit, X was X double bar minus A2 times R bar. So we, and I looked up A2 from the constant table for SPC, it's 0.577. And uh, once we have that, I put everything in here, X double bar, 33.6. And they may just give you average in the question. You use what they give you. We assume it's X double bar, 33.6 plus A2. I looked up in the table of 5 0.577, R bar of 6.20. Now the only difference between upper and lower control limit is instead of adding A2 times R bar, you're subtracting A2 times R bar. Remember, A2 times R bar equals three sigmas, three sigmas of the averages. If they gave, they could give you different uh, numbers here to where you don't have everything you need, they just give you sigma. Well, and they give you sample size. Then you go three times sigma over the square root of N, is going to give you the same thing. They do that sometimes. Uh, most people are trained on these old formulas, but the new ones are more accurate. What's the new one? X double bar plus three times sigma of individuals divided by the square root of n. Okay. But in this case, they gave us everything we need for this traditional formula that Schuert created. So let's go ahead and punch those numbers in and see what we get for an upper and lower control limit. So 6.20 times 0 0.577. 3.57. So when you do these where you have to calculate the upper and the lower control limit, always write down the value of 3 sigma so you don't have to calculate it twice. So this is uh, 
3.577, which is what? Equal to three sigmas right there. Three sigmas of what? Averages or single events? Averages. Uh, 8 2 times r bar is for sigma of averages. Okay, now we just simply add that plus 33.6 equals 37.1774. So the upper control limit equals 37.1774. Oh, and I erased. I erased my three sigma thing there that I told you to write down, but that's okay. I'll, I'll plug it in again. But remember, on the time test, you don't want to plug it in again, so you want to uh, keep that written down, which you'll have to in the test anyway. So I'm going to go 0 0.577 times 6.20 equals 3.5774. There it is. I couldn't remember it at first, but that sounds right. 3.5774. And then I'm going to subtract that from the average, so 33.6 minus 3.5774. 3.5774 equals uh, basically 30, 30.0227. 30 and I have students ask me a lot, well, what do I round, at, round to? Uh, on these ASQ exams, and I've overdone it here. Usually you look and say, okay, there's two decimal points, I'm going to go out three. And so I went out four. But uh, if you go out, and if you use that rule, you're going to be just fine on the ASQ exam. All right, now that we know the upper and lower control limit for the averages chart, let's go ahead and go to the range chart and calculate the upper and lower control limit for that. So here we are, the formulas for upper control limit of the range is D4 times R bar. Lower control limit is D3 times R bar. I look D up D4. Remember, you should be able to find these equations easily and confidently uh, before you go take the test. I looked up D4 is 2.114. D3 for a sample size of 5. How did I get sample size of 5? They gave me 5 numbers in that sample group. Uh, and that's how I knew it was 5. D3 equals 0 when a sample size is 5. Remember, it will always e equal 0 until I believe the sample size gets above 7. I have it out right here. Let me see. Uh, D3. Yes, at 7, it starts taking upon itself a number other than 0. That's the D3 value there. So be aware of that. It's not always 0, just if it's uh, less than 7 sample size. Okay. With that being said, they already gave me the range earlier. I wrote that down earlier. And so upper control limit of the range equals my D4 value times my R bar, which is 6.20 right there. So let's go ahead and plug that in. 2.114 times 6.20 R bar equals... 13.1068. Okay, that's the upper control limit. I should write that right there. Okay, and then of course the lower control limit is multiplied by zero, so it's going to be zero. That's an easy one. All right. Now we know our upper and lower values of our upper and lower control limits. Now we need to go back to that subgroup, calculate the average, calculate the uh, range, and then see how that lies within these control limits. All right, so I wrote down those numbers that they gave us, and I calculated the average and the range, high minus low there, and then I look at that and say, okay, where does the average lie on the control limits? Uh, does it lie within or outside? Well, 35.8 lies uh, right in there. It's a little bit above the average, which would be 33.5 something. Uh, but it lies within the control limits. But 18, range of 18, lies what? Above the upper control limit. So the range shows special cause. Average does not.
Let's go back to the blue pages and see if that uh, if we can find the correct answer. All right, here we are back at the blue pages, and uh, let's see, read these, see which one is the correct answer. Both the average and range are within the control limits. No, the average was, the range was not. Neither the average nor the range were within control limits. No, the average was within control limits. Only the average was outside control limits. No, so it must be D. Only the range was outside the control limits. This is true. So the correct answer for question 12 is D. Here we are at question 10. Remember, this was going to be our last one. I'm actually going to do one more because I looked through the blue pages and I saw one that always shows up on the certification exam and it's a number crunching one, so I just wanted to go over that one with you. It's question 16, so we'll do that next. Uh, 1110, what is the major difference between DFX and DMAIC? Design for X, such as design for safety, design for environment, design for uh, quality, etc., etc., etc. There's many X's, and they ask you questions on those usually, so you should know where to look up DFX in your primer to find uh, all those different types of X's. Or the DMAIC, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control, of course. One is product design approach, and the other is problem solving approach. DMAIC is a problem solving approach, and DFX is a design approach. That's why it says design for. Okay, so A is correct. We'll read the other ones just for educational purposes. One concentrates on functions and performance, and the other does not. Uh, they could both uh, bleed into that. One has limited number of process steps, whereas the other was virtually unlimited. No, they could both be unlimited virtually. So that's wrong. There are few differences. They can operate independently or together. Uh, there are differences. Okay, there are differences because one's a product design approach and the other one is a problem solving approach. So A is the correct answer for question 10. All right, here we are at question 16. A, corp a corporation makes a product which is a blend of three ingredients, A, B, and C. If the individual tolerances for the weights of the three ingredients are as shown below, what would be the tolerance for the blended product? Well, we add tolerances just like we add standard deviations. Remember how we add uh, standard deviations? Sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared plus sigma 3 squared, etc. Square root of those. Well, it's the same thing here. Uh, ingredient A, 66 plus minus 3 grams. So we're going to go 3 squared plus 2 squared plus 1.73 squared. And you may say, wait, it's plus minus. It must be 6. No, you just take one side of the tolerance. So if they gave you a tolerance spread of 6, then you'd say, oh, I need to convert that over to plus minus, and uh, because that will give you your plus minus at the end. Okay, so that's how you do it, and uh, I'm not going to go to the whiteboard on this one, but I'll tell you what the answer is. 3 squared, which of course is 9, plus 2 squared, which is 4, add that, plus 1.73 squared, which happens to be 2.99 something, almost 3, then you go equals, and that equals uh, approximately 16. Then you take, of course, the square root of that, and you get uh, 3.99 or 4, because it's 3.39s. Okay, so 4 is going to be plenty close enough. So it's going to be, first you have to add these together, 66, 76, 86, 96, 100. That's how they got the 100 and then plus minus by uh, squaring those, adding them together, taking the square root, which will give you the correct answer of C. Well, congratulations. Uh, you should be getting very close to taking your certification exam, or at least uh, you're close to being ready. Hopefully you'll, hopefully you'll take it pretty soon. You still need to practice those uh, practice tests, so practice those until you get a solid 80% on those, and that sends the signal that you're ready to go. Then take the final exams also. They're pretty small and quick, uh, but that'll help prepare you. You should get 80%. I say 80%, but, you know, if you get uh, 78, you know, right in there, you're doing, uh, you'll be fine. You should be fine. That's my experience. The only thing I can't help you with is test anxieties, and that's uh, after everyone makes it through my class and does all the things I ask them, if they still fail, which it's a remote, 
then uh, it's usually because they experience test anxieties. And so try to keep that under control. Uh, but other than that, it's been a great uh, honor of mine to help you prepare for your certification exam. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, and have a great day. Goodbye. Congratulations, you have completed this video. If you have any questions, please let me know. As you can see, I have a lot of experience. I've passed most of the ASQ certification exams myself. If you have any questions, please contact me through my website at alphatc.com. Again, that's alphatc for Alpha Training and Consulting, alphatc.com, and uh, go to our contact option and contact me. Send me a message. I'll get right back with you. Hey, thank you, and have a great day. Goodbye.